Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, there's a lot to cover here today, so I'm going to try and move it along kind of quickly. Uh, starting with, when you go to see Canaveral's plants in Long Island, you want to see some beautiful places. Here's just an example of one of them, a uh, pond over in Manorville that has all sorts of aquatic utricularia, which are otherwise known as platyworts, and uh, sun use all along the pond shores. Uh, there is three genus of carnivorous plants on Long Island uh, with 16 species, one species of a plant, three of uh, the sundews with a hybrid as well, and um, 12 species of utricularia, which are platyworts. Uh, starting with here is the uh, common round leaf sundew, which you find all around the world. Uh, they grow quite beautifully on Long Island. Uh, this example here is in a sphagnum bog. It uh, has nice long stems here, kind of a woolly texture. Uh, here we have a, another uh, Drosera rotundifolia, the common round leaf sundew. And you can see it has a very, this is dry, growing in a drier environment. Most of the time you're going to see them in sphagnum bogs. And if you are hiking through the woods and you come across freshwater, uh, sphagnum, moss, a lot of the times you're going to find these guys. They're a good indicator of a, a good habitat. And uh, you can even find them in sandy, uh, drier areas as well. And that's what we're seeing here. Uh, shorter, they tend to grow a bit shorter of a stem with a woolier texture. And you can see this guy is sitting with a flower uh, earlier in the season. Here's a good example of the, uh, the traps. We can see they're kind of wider than they are taller, and that's a good way to kind of tell that you're looking at around the sun. Uh, here you can see one feeding. Uh, sometimes they'll, they'll catch them here on the outer uh, stalks and then kind of pull them into the center to digest them. And this one kind of, this photograph here kind of makes me think he's just kind of eating it like yum, yum, yum. As a little bonus, you can see uh, these spore capsules in the background of uh, the sphagnum, which is something you don't really see too often. Uh, I was lucky enough to get it in this work. Next up, this is Drosera uh, inter intermediate. Uh, this spoon leaf sundew goes by a number of different common names. Uh, you can see clearly the difference between the two here. This one's much taller than it is wider. And uh, that's a good indicator of what you're looking at if you're out in the field and you come across some sundews. The two of them are very similar uh, most of the time. I'm going to see some interesting examples of uh, the intermediate. Uh, this is what most of us are familiar with intermediate is you'll see these little low-growing rosettes on the, you know, scattered about the ground. And uh, they, they can be fairly common. <coughs> Uh, they're as common as the uh, retundifolia, but they're quite common as well. Here's a larger example, probably about a uh, yay big or so. Much larger example. Uh, you don't see them like that very often. And uh, you can see in this photograph too, you can see how the stems are very smooth as opposed to the retundifolia is hairy the stems. Same thing around. They'll come in hand later. Uh, here is an interesting habit of uh, intermediate that you don't see everywhere. Along the eastern seaboard, you see this pretty commonly. It's a it's an adaptation of flooding, where they'll grow these big long stalks in the rosette at the top. So what happened here? This photograph was taken this past summer, and if you all remember, it was raining like had some dogs early in the season, and then the floodwaters receded, and these guys will, as an adaptation to cope with the flooding, they grow these big long stems at the top of the, the surface, float at the top. Uh, appearing kind of like this at the top of the, of the surface. A lot of times the water is exactly clear, it's kind of muddy, just like that. Um, here before, this is this is very interesting because whereas here you'll see it's kind of like a rosette, here is earlier in the season when it hasn't flooded yet and it's growing these kind of the, the stem, um, the leaves off. <coughs> intermittently, kind of like a tree. So the carnivorous plant enthusiast does for itself, this is known as the tree fruit. It grows upright with those kind of branches of the tree, which is a very interesting growth habitat. It's not very recognized at the moment. Um, I think there's going to be 
a lot more uh, study about this in the future. This was first observed in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, this habit, uh, <clears throat> like 20, 30 years ago, and it's never really been picked up on since. It's been seen in North Carolina, um, I believe in Florida, Massachusetts, and Maryland Island. So this same sphagnum bog at the, the same time of year, which I think was in late May, early June of 2012, those tree forms, it was, it was heavy rains at the spring as well. And the rains kind of toppled them over, across the sphagnum bog, and they just started sending out runners like mad, little offshoots of uh, new plants kind of growing, you know, um, uh, dividing off of off these stems that are across the, the sphagnum bogs. And then later on in the same season, you can see how they just spread like madness. Uh, one of the other common names for the intermedia is the birds of the sun, which you can see here is kind of like a big nest. It's pretty cool. And this, this was probably about a yeah, big, just this one clump. So that would catch a mantis easily. Very sticky, very, very sticky. Uh, here is a sandy habitat. It was the last stagnant habitat we saw. It. And this is growing very red, very exposed into the sunlight, beautiful crimson red. Uh, nothing out of the ordinary. You give, you give a plant more color, it's going to get redder. This one in particular is very interesting. Uh, here's what's interesting is another one of these tree form type of intermediate. Uh, Nice and red, nice little flower store for me too, but it's in a sandy habitat. Again, um, it's, it's on the edge of a vernal pond shore, so there is a lot of fluctuation in the water levels uh, that you'll see at this time. So there is a lot of flooding and then receding, flooding, receding throughout the year, seasonal, year by year. So it has those kinds of adaptations, but it hadn't flooded here yet. So it's just growing as high as it can on its own. And it's in a sandy habitat. A lot of the uh, times in the past, the tree forms were observed was in the uh, sphagnum habitats. All right. Yeah, here's a pretty dramatic photograph. <laughs> it had nothing to do with it. It was all on its own. As a matter of fact, so this wasn't even that large of an intermediate, but it wasn't the usual small ones that you'll see. Um, I came across this, and here, here the I, I thought the dragonfly was was done for. You know, he was just kind of staring off into space, arms all folded. And as I'm taking pictures of it, it starts unfurling its arms and starts waving around. It's looking right at me with his little eyes, and I can almost hear a teeny little voice. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and he was really stuck. He was really stuck. And he, what's really cool too is. You can see how the lower leaves are actually kind of growing around the, the softer body tissues. Put them by the, um, the, the, the wings. It's, it kind of, it's all starting to kind of, you know, come on to it. So the plants, the plants are actually quite animated. Um, all their movement is done by growth, and they, they grow pretty quickly. So uh, not quite as dramatic as, like, say, a Venus flytrap, where it grows shut in a split second. But, um, Okay, this is really cool because this is a hybrid of the two sundews, the rotundifolia and intermedia. And this is something that's not very, you know, not very common. Uh, it's been seen throughout the world. They're both in a row together, like England, uh, especially New Jersey pine barrens. I've seen examples from Massachusetts. I've heard of examples, uh, the original descriptions from France. Um, so they have been seen, but. And pretty, pretty uncommon. Um, a, good, a good way to normally tell them is that they, they tend to grow larger than either of the parents. So you have these big, long stems. Um, <coughs> in particular, you'll see how the, the crown is very fuzzy, like the rotundifolia, whereas you saw how the uh, intermediate were a lot smoother. And then here we have kind of a blending of the two traps. Where I had shown you before, they um, from the foliar are wider than they are taller, and the um, intermediate are taller than they are wider. Here's kind of a nice, clear example of uh, <laughs> mixing the two. And 
And uh, I've only seen these in a couple of spots on the map. And this, I took a picture of in 2012. I went back to the same spot. I couldn't, couldn't find it. It's a pretty tricky area to wall sell, so I could just be in one spot. Um, just there for the formants. Here is a rather dramatic <coughs> sun. Uh, and it's clearly, you can clearly tell the difference between this and the other two that we were just looking at. Nice long thread like uh, leaves, and as the sun sets, it can be rather dramatic, kind of making it look like a lazy spot of fire. It's very cool. Uh, nice nice uh, close up of an individual plant um, taken out, you know, the background color isn't too bad, so you can see it fairly clear. Nice rosette and leaves kind of going up uh, with the same kind of little tentacles with the dew drops at the end as the other two. Uh, Drosera uh, philoformis is, is not a common plant at all. Uh, just growing along the eastern seaboard and um, a cousin of its uh, uh, Drosera tracei or philoformis uh, mar tracei, right, depending on which side of the taxonomist you go on. Um, they only grow, uh, Tracy I grows around the, uh, the Gulf states, a couple of examples of philophonus uh, in the Florida panhandle. Otherwise, it's New Jersey pine barrens have taken all the glory for the philophonus. Now it's time for the island, come on, smoke. But uh, they could also be found in Nova Scotia, um, Cape Cod, uh, Delaware, Maryland, just a couple of spots, uh, North Carolina. A few spots that are dwindling very quickly. These are disappearing in the wild quite a bit. New England, they disappeared quite a bit. Uh, North Carolina, they disappearing quite a bit. <coughs> so, what we have here on Long Island is very special. It's probably, it could possibly be the second most significant population outside the New Jersey Highlands of this plant. I'm not sure though. They you have to basically take a survey of all the places to, to be able to tell for sure. Um, Long Island uh, habitats are very impressive. Here's a filiformis flower. A nice, uh, you can see that pollen um, on it and everything. Nice, nice detail close up. The trap's kind of right there, you know. I, I would think that kind of discourages pollinators. But this guy went right for the flower. You know, he was going from flower to flower to flower, uh, skipping everything else except for the filiformis flowers, and practically weaving through the traps. Uh, delicate little puppet fly that he is. Um, in the full that I grow in my backyard, I found one of these unfortunate guys stuck to the plant uh, later in the season. But uh, by the next day, he seemed to have broken himself loose. These usually catch smaller insects. Uh, nice close up of the, um, of the traps. Now. Nice close up of the traps. You can see they have kind of unfurl like ferns. Uh, it just really light up in the sun. It's great. Uh, prey capture. Much smaller than what you saw with the intermediate. The intermediate with the dragonfly, I've never seen the nervous plant catch anything about that size. This is even large for a filiformis. Usually they catch multitudes of smaller bugs, like you'll see right here. It's just a little bug, all the tentacles kind of grow and encapsulate it with the, the musculature and uh, actually suffocate it to death for uh, breaking it down and digesting it. Kind of gruesome, but this makes it interesting. Uh, this guy was struggling at all well, and I, you know, I don't think he made it out, but uh, it's not really the usual size of prey that you would see what by filiformis. Okay, matricularia, so overlooked on one island. Um, there's 12 species, so there's most diversity of any carnivorous plant, but they kind of have the least amount of personality. Unless you look really closely. When you look closely, you see this amazing world that they that they, that they, they, they occupy. And uh, here's a particularly good example. It's uh, Tricularia, uh, Tricularia striata, uh, which is fairly large growing, so you can see the traps pretty well. They grow in shallow ponds, have a nice reflection of the sandy, um, Subshade at the bottom here. So it kind of just really lightens up this, uh, this series of traps. Uh, these are empty traps that haven't been caught, haven't caught anything yet. You can see how there's these 
um, these little like um, filaments that come off these sacks, and there's a little trap door right here, and there's these longer um, striations that come off uh, essential stone. So with these, the um, these actually guide floating um, things in the pond towards the, uh, the trapdoor mounds, and these will further guide floating stuff as it passes. It's kind of you know drawn in, drawn in, and then when it hits the trigger hairs that are close to the mouth, it'll boom, it'll open up the trapdoor, and the platter has actually created a vacuum inside there. It sucks in the prey, and uh, the trap door closes, and that's when it digests. And here we go. These are the traps digest. You see all the purple. It's like the digestive enzymes, and the, you know, the prey that's put in there. And it'll trap, digest, and reset all within a day. Uh, it's a very quick moving thing. All these little dots, though, I've shown to um, professional scientists and all sorts of people. Nobody's quite figured out what these little dots are. Maybe they're algae type creatures that are feeding on. No, wait. They would be feeding on the algae that's growing on the stones. Some kind of little thing goes on. And maybe it's catching a whole lot of them at once into these traps. I'm not really quite sure. But uh, you see, this is a great example of you know, seeing the, the traps digesting after you see them you know, uh, in there and they're ready for. Uh, here we go. This is the flower Utricularia jibba, which is a lot like striata, and they're very easily confused. There's a couple of discerning differences, but that would be a whole talk in itself. <laughs> Talking about the differences between each species of Utricularia that's on Long Island, that we'll talk. Some of them are very, very similar to each other, and can be pretty difficult to tell the difference between them. This whole year, pick up on a couple of little you know, deciding factors, and then once you get used to those, it becomes kind of a little easier. Never easy, though. <laughs> uh, Utricularia cornuda, uh, the horn one. It's these kind of horns that you see on the flowers. They tend to grow semi-terrestrial in shallow water, very, very shallow water. Uh, I kind of think the flowers, the flowers make me think more than the horn one make me think three musketeers on it. And uh, here's, here's what the uh, plant itself looks like. So you have a stolen running underneath the surface of the soil, and you have these shoots that grow up and out of the soil to these grass-like uh, structures. Then you have these other shoots that grow down into the soil to anchor it, like roots or not roots. And then you have much smaller traps all over the place, almost like little bubbles, except for that one's actually a bubble. Um, and there's a whole lot more of these traps. It's just that when I pulled it out of the soil, a lot of the traps kind of, kind of got ripped off as well. Um, so here's, here's a good example of something that you wouldn't normally see, like the underworkings of the utricularia, which is what makes it interesting. Uh, utricularia recipinata. Uh, this you don't really see in flowers too often. It only grows in one place that I'm familiar with on the island. And, um, like I'm saying, they don't, they don't flower very well. So this was, this, was a pretty, this was a pretty good find. I was pretty happy when I came across this. Uh, and here is a good example of its interesting spur and uh, elongated body, kind of a C shaped form. A mini orchid, snapdragon kind of purple, purple flower. Uh, most of the time, when you see Utricularia, the yellow, yellow flowers on the lap. There's Respinata and Purpurea. Two purple flowers. Intermediate has kind of like a whitish yellow flower. And that's one way to tell, I guess, a few of them are. Uh, and the picture plants usually steal the thunder of any universal plant presentation for Long Island. So I kind of left them to the last and I to cover the sundews a little bit more and the bladder uh, as well. Uh, the Subspecies of pitcher plants that grow on Long Island are, are uh, described as being subspecies purpurea, which is the northern form, that are smooth body, they're very long, 
very long with smaller blades, with smooth bodies. What we're seeing here is a shorter squatter form with a nice, great undulating hood and a bit of a fuzzy body surface, which is more like the subspecies Venosa that we find out south. Uh, in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, there's been um, examples that were described as being intermediate between the two. And I think that's what we're seeing here. It's kind of is that same intermediate that has been noticed by people, not formally described or anything. Who knows what it really is among taxonomists? I mean, the plants will just keep growing however they do, and no matter what we call them, is the way I see it. We can call this, we can call them that. It's the same old plant. But here's, this is just a great form, great, great hood on my back. Um, nearby here is a full plant that you can see. Um, kind of ragged, you know, these are the, the broken leaves from the, the year before where as they're filled with water, when it freezes, they'll uh, kind of break open. And uh, these are the new growth, the new seed. Uh, these photographs are from a, uh, a sphagnum bog that's in a white Atlantic cedar forest um, in the Pine Barrens. So you can see these are pretty much the same habitats as the uh, future plants that you'll see in the New Jersey pine barrens. Which, like I said, New Jersey pine barrens still are thunder. Here we are, the Lionel pine barrens. And here's the, uh, the white Atlantic cedar forest. There's white Atlantic cedars here. Or this lovely muck. Definitely, definitely do not miss that. And um, pretty much yeah, that pretty much uh, wraps up the presentation. I have a few photographs of cannabis plants from the, uh, the wilderness of Fire Island by where the breach uh, took place. But since we're kind of running out of time, I could, I could go either way. I could answer questions, or I can go into the Fire Island wilderness. <coughs> let the crowd decide. Wilderness. <laughs> wilderness. All right. I love the great choice. So this is the Fire Island wilderness. This was last year. Um, before everything was basically wiped out. Well, we go there now, it's all sand. Or at least when I went last uh, summer. Was, this, this was the summer of 2012. 2013 was all sand. This interesting little place is it's still there. It still survived, thankfully. Everything else was wiped out around it. But uh, at least this guy's here. And it's, there's a little pond that's in inside there with this brush dead brush, I guess, that kind of protects that, that pond. And um, it turns into a foggy-like habitat towards, towards the outskirts of the pond, where it's kind of, you know, dries, dries out. You see in the background, all that beautiful green that's over. Uh, it'll come back. And here's the fresh water itself. It's in there. I was surprised. Uh, I was, I was looking for some dudes in the Fire Island wilderness for years. And I came across this spot by accident. I was actually, I was looking through Google Maps, looking at what would be an appropriate place to look for them. And as I was studying out towards uh, this direction, I was walking along the sand, and in the tracks I saw fox tracks. Then I started seeing more and more of them. And I thought, hey, this is kind of interesting. Let me just follow and see what it's called. And it turns out there's a fox den right on the other side of it. And they lived right to it. It was almost, I don't know, a spirit guide or something. I was looking for this. They showed it to me, they showed me where it is. Uh, okay, so not the prettiest of all the, the cannabis plant photographs I've shown you so far. These were taken with my iPhone, not, not a DSLR. And this was after Irene. Uh, so I'm guessing that there was some salt water overwash. To, I mean, it's protected by a series of dunes. It's not just one dune there. There's a couple of dunes protecting this area. Not anymore. It's just really protecting now. It's just flat. So I'm, I'm, ex I'm thinking that there was some salt water overwash from Irene, um, which explains the uh, dead stag that's kind of coming back. But this uh, sun dune is looking fantastic. Sarah would find the foliage, as you can see, with the wider and taller traps. And it's sitting on a flower stalk. So it's, it's a happy camper. Cranberry coming up around it. When I went this past summer, I didn't find any sphagnum at all. It's completely overwashed. You can see all the debris in there. 
Um, but there's cranberry that's grown like gangbusters. I mean, better than, better than this here. Cranberry is really going good. So I, I assume that this is going to come back. I assume. I'm probably going to go back and you know, keep, my, keep my eye in place. You know, I'll, I'll visit next year. I don't see anything either. Maybe the year after. Who knows? But uh, here's like some you know, pretty, pretty ragged sphagnum that were on the edges of this pond. Edges of this pond. And uh, yeah, little colonies of Tungifolia. They probably got set back from the year before. I bet you there was overwashing right now. Uh, and these are intermediate. Uh, they can be difficult to tell the difference between them, especially when they're small. I mean, they could be very, they could, they could look pretty much the same, but really small. Uh, this was like in a, in a sandy swath that was nearby the pond, not quite at the pond. So there's like a puddle that uh, seems to be, that dries out and stays permanently wet. Like the soil seems to stay permanently wet. Great habitat for, for, uh, for intermediate. Nice and sandy, nice and wet. And you know, you can see how the traps are a little bit more wider and also the smoother, smoother stems. They were quite small, so they were probably, you know, within I, I doubt I don't think they were stunted, I think they were just very young. They, yeah, the, the character of the habitat kind of kind of you know, tends, tends to tell me that you're looking at uh, an area that it's wiped out by salt water and then they kind of come back from sea and then, you know, so on and so forth. Which kind of keeps the habitat clear. A lot of times the carnivorous plants are uh, poor uh, competitors, so they kind of need that periodic clearing out. Uh, pioneer plants, as I consider. Um, some of the areas I, I've uh, observed them, there was the Manorville fires in 2012. In 2013, I saw some great carnivorous plants there, uh, and, uh, hill forms in particular. Uh, all the flooding that we had earlier in the season, later in the season, it killed all the competing growth of the carnivorous plants were still there. Uh, they kind of, <coughs> which, uh, the, the sundews in particular, they'll, they'll kind of go to their buds and during the, uh, the flooding, and they'll come back out of the flooding uh, proceedings. So they are, they are very, uh, they're adapted to those kinds of disturbances that, in a lot of cases, we're preventing them. Um, especially with the fires, you know, like the fires of the high barrens are very beneficial to the wildlife. We don't like them much, but by preventing the forest fires, you're also building up more kindling, you see a bigger fire. Man, that's a whole different discussion. Uh, finally, this is just, um, this is a hybrid between filiformis and intermediate. It's only ever been discovered in the New Jersey pine barrens. But like I said, I think it's time for why not find one. We got, yeah, we're on the map too. We got pine barrens also. Uh, but this is this is kind of hard to tell the differences. They tend to have short, clubbier um, leaves than the filiformis. Very easily confused with the filiformis. So if you're ever out there in the wild. And if you're looking at filiformis, and you see one that's kind of short, clubby look, you know, clubby looking, that's, uh, here's it, like how the tendrils kind of come off a pointed end. That's something that you don't really see with uh, filiformis uh, quite as dramatically. And uh, they tend to be large and clumsy. You might have just been the person that discovered uh, hybrida. It's a ball. Drosera hybrida. And this, this, is just, this is just to show you how easy it is to confuse hybrid with filiformis. This is filiformis earlier in the season. It's kind of coming out of dormancy. And one of the other um, discerning, uh, very, this is probably the most um, uh, characteristic of hybrid is that it's smooth at the bottom of the leaf. And then there's the tentacle. Uh, where filiformis is tentacles to roll along. But again, this was early in the season. I went back to the same spot later in the season, and it had the telltale filiformis look. So keep your eye out. And I'd say with that, that pretty much covers the first principle now. Sure. Uh, Mr. Um, what happens to the exoskeleton of the carnivorous plants? Do they somehow get rid of them? I don't see a lot of exoskeleton. Exoskeleton, 
Well, I, I, I'm kind of like a purist when I photograph a plant. I usually try not to get like, because I, I feel it makes the plant look dirty, which kind of takes away from the um, presentation of this. But I like to have a nice clean photograph. So I rarely ever do like big captures um, for, uh, for photographs. I usually try to get the purity of the plant. But uh, the, the exoskeletons, they, they dry up, and especially with the sun tubes, because there really is nowhere for them to go. Um, they just kind of dry up and shrivel up to like a little you know, nothing. And uh, sometimes they get carried away in the wind. And in a lot of cases, what you have is, is a leaf, after a couple of captures, it just die off and a new leaf will grow out. And throughout the season, it just, there's new leaves, you know, old leaves are dying, new leaves are growing pretty quickly. They grow, they grow like gangbusters early in the season. And a lot of the, a, lot of, a, lot of, a big part of the reason why they want to eat insects is they want energy to send up these big flowers to keep, to keep away from the traps. But it, 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 a lot of the energy goes into flowering. So once, once they flower, in some cases, they just kind of go into dormancy and disappear or whatever um, uh, for the, to wait for the next year to send up, you know, to flower and some things. One more. Yeah. Um, are, are these plants under a lot of pressure for collectors? That is a danger. Uh, picture plants, in particular, there was a really great location in the cranberry bogs of uh, in one of the cranberry bogs of Long Island, and there was all sorts of like I mean you have who knows how old some of these are twenty years, fifty years old, and these plants go for a long, long time. And uh, from what I heard, uh, someone went back to this location like, oh, there's a great bunch of plants. All they found was holes all over the place. So who knows what happens? To them. Maybe somebody dug them up to either sell them at a roadside stand, where you know you never know. When you go to some of these garden markets, you know, you, you, you buy, oh, that's a neat, you know, neat picture plant. They might have just dug it out from the, um, you know, from bogs. Or maybe someone just wanted to make a bog garden in their backyard. Or who knows? These days, you have to worry about it on eBay. You know, there's, there's a lot of people that are into cannabis plants are, are very sensitive to the fact that uh, there's people out there that will do this. Uh, in the Carolinas, fly traps. In North Carolina, fly traps are constantly under pressure because that's the most saleable plants. People are always, I mean, they'll go in with garbage bags, big garbage bags out into the wild. And each, you know, flight trap's a tiny little thing. So to fill up a garbage bag like that, it's going to take thousands. And you're taking thousands out of the gene. Um, those thousands now don't have a chance to set seed, to, to grow the next generation. And it is really, that's, that's a good question. It's really, really is, uh, poaching is, is a very big threat, uh, as opposed to, all the other threats on top of you know, habitat disappearance and disturbance and all that. <coughs> We're going to have to cut it off there.